Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Defect Prevention, a Tester's Role in Process Improvement and Reducing Cost of Poor Quality by Mike Ennis. We're excited you're able to join us today. Set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars offered by IIST. Be sure to join us for the next webinar in the series, Compatibility Testing for Mobile Apps and Websites by Michael Udanen on March 31st from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and other webinars in this series, go to testinginstitute.com. Please feel free to ask uh, the presenter questions throughout the presentation today. Mike is, it will answer these uh, uh, as they come through. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within uh, 48 hours at testinginstitute.com. This webinar is a preview of a full course uh, that will be offered live online, interactive, April 19th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and register, go to testinginstitute.com slash online slash live interactive dot php. At the end of today's webinar, you'll be asked to complete a short survey. At IIST, we strive to provide the highest quality educational resources for the public and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete this short survey. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Mike Ennis. Mike? Uh, thank you, Eric. And and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to some of the folks are, that are joining. As Eric mentioned, this is uh, a one-hour snippet of a full of a full day course, and I hope that uh, it's going to be informative and that you can get a lot out of your time today. And once again, thank you for taking some time uh, today. Our course today is going to be on defect prevention, which is a, a subject that is uh, very important uh, to me and I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Hopefully we'll be able to explain really what this means from a tester's perspective and how you can provide a lot of value in your organizations. And as Eric mentioned, if you've got questions, uh, feel free to write your questions and I'll, I'll try to answer them as I see them. If I miss any of the questions, you can feel free to, to email me and I promise you I will I will answer any and all questions that I may not have been able to get to during this uh, webinar. A uh, little bit about me, uh, I've got over 25 years in the software, software development uh, industry, uh, a variety of roles from software development, mainly testing, QA process improvement, uh, test assessments and maturity. Uh, over the last 10 years I've been in managed consulting, uh, working with some of the top five uh, firms in the world. I've worked across the United States, India, Australia, the Middle East. Uh, other courses that I teach, agile testing, defect prevention, which is just one, process improvement, metrics is very important, teamwork leadership, also emotional intelligence in terms of uh, the new type of skills that managers will need to be successful in today's market. A uh, host of, of uh, software certifications. I've also been the, the keynote speaker at, at a few conferences as well. So I thank you for your, your time today. Uh, what we're going to cover over the next hour is understanding a little bit more about defect prevention, why it's so important. We'll talk about the differences between QA and QC. Uh, we'll spend some time really identifying why defects occur in the first place. We'll give an overview of some defect prevention techniques, also defect detection techniques. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about process improvement. Then we'll jump into uh, understanding what are some of the key metrics that drive process improvement. And I've added a, a few examples that we can talk about today uh, from the development as well as the testing perspective. So it's a pretty, pretty packed uh, agenda. Uh, let's talk about defect prevention versus defect detection. So at a high level, defect prevention are, these are any technique that's, the, that's designed to find defects before the actual artifact has been developed. Defect detection, this is more of our formal testing techniques. These are techniques used to find defects after an artifact has been developed or that an artifact is under test. Um, why is this so important? Um, for many of you, as you probably know, uh, the cost of finding a defect uh, multiplies uh, exponentially 
from the moment that defect is first introduced or injected into the software or to the product. As you can see reading from left to right, if a defect is, is injected into the, into the system during the analyze phase, the cost is almost uh, a one-to-one -one ratio if you were to remove that defect at that phase. And you can see um, that same defect, if it's found in design, build, test, uh, deployment, and in production, you can see that the cost of, of fixing that defect uh, multiplies um, hundreds of times, even uh, if, it, if it leaks to the customer. So each time a defect is not caught in the phase in which it is introduced, we call that defect leakage or we call that uh, lack of phase containment. So the purpose for defect prevention is really to try to identify and remove the defect as early or as close to its origination phase as possible. Uh, stage containment. So I mentioned this context, this, this concept on the previous slide. In most organizations, now I'm, I'm saying this is most, we're talking about software development. Uh, the lion's share of, of defects originate. You can see our graph here. 40 to 60 percent of defects originate or are injected in our requirements and design phase. And you can see that uh, 20 to 40 percent are usually injected or originate in coding or uh, assembly or, or uh, integration testing. Uh, at the bottom of that, of this graph, you can see defect discovery. This is the typical phase in which we would normally find a defect. It's very important that you that you are capturing metrics like this, and we'll do that towards the end of the webinar, so that you can see the phase in which a defect originated or was injected versus when you found that defect. Understanding that is is really the first step for containing or understanding what your defect leakage is, also the effectiveness of your testing, uh, because what we want is we want solid stage uh, containment. As we look at the next part of the slide, you can see that now we've added typically where, where these defects are discovered, and you can see that our lines are almost horizontal in many cases where the same defect that we just talked about that originated in requirements and design, the 40 to 60 percent, you can see that in most cases, not in every case, in most cases, 40 to 60 percent of defects are being discovered in your assembly test, product test, maintenance, and even in the in your in production uh, that's visible to the to the customer. Where you can see, if we go back. 10 to 20 percent are discovered during the actual phase in which it was injected. Uh, 20 to 50 percent were found during uh, the coding phase. So this is a very important distinction. So if you were, if this were your project or your application, we would say that we don't have very good stage containment. So this would be a problem. But unfortunately, this is how uh, this is. Uh, a good picture of how most testing is done, where most of our defects, almost all of them, are being found during our formal uh, testing phases or our defect detection phases. Uh, a little bit, just uh, another graphic around early versus late detection. We can see that um, most defects are being found by their, our own methods um, in these later phases where everything that happens prior to your formal testing phase or prior to assembly tests or prior to your system test will be considered defect prevention. So that's really laid the, lays the outline for what we're going to be talking about in this webinar. Understanding what are the type of things that we can be doing from a defect prevention perspective to reduce defects from happening in the first place, and you know, defect prevention 
that term, it's really we're not preventing defects because once the defect has been uh, introduced, it's 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 there. What we're doing is we're trying to prevent it from showing up in later phases. So that's a better way of of giving that that terminology. Uh, typical things that institute QA versus QC. Uh, QA is typically uh, a staff function. In some organizations, this might be a group of people that set aside standards and review uh, how processes are going and how processes are, are being adhered to. They define the processes where defect detection is more of your your traditional quality control type of type of functions. Typical things that occur in defect prevention. Defect prevention is a, is a proactive approach to defects. Um, and it's looking at a lot of metrics. It's looking at a lot of reviews. It's understanding how and when defects are being found with the objective of identifying those defects as early in the process as possible. Uh, I like to show this graphic. It really shows the, the relationship between uh, quality assurance, quality control, as well as your development cycle, which is across the bottom. You can see that in a typical development cycle, we go through a planning phase where requirements are being gathered. There's an analyzed phase. Um, from a development perspective, our developers are creating functional design specs based on those requirements that uh, go into our, as I mentioned, functional design specs, which then go into our coding, which then go into our our, um, our assembly test or our unit test, and then it goes into your more traditional coding phases here after code is complete, and then we these are your more formal testing phases, whether it be product test, system test, end-to-end, -end, and then deployment. Well, above this line, you can see how your quality assurance group or function uh, works hand in hand with your traditional testing group, which is notified in the in the blue versus the red. So, as requirements are being gathered from a QA perspective, those requirements should be reviewed and signed off. From a quality control perspective, those requirements are being translated into your project plan, uh, your overall test strategy. Uh, test plan, which should be by your QA team reviewed and signed off, which would then lead into your test case creation, which also lend itself to review and sign off. Uh, as you move into your build cycle, you might be doing some environment setup. These are the roles of your of your testing team. Uh, automation may also start occurring at this phase. Uh, the project goes under change control, and then you get into your, your traditional test case execution. This graphic uh, at a high level lays out your overall software development life cycle, and it shows how these different groups tend to work together. That's an, this is a, an important graphic which will lay the foundation for, for everything that we talk about. So. So why do defects occur in the, in the first place? We'll spend a little time talking here. Um, human beings, uh, we, are, we are fallible. Humans make mistakes. Oftentimes, um, we are tasked to, too heavily. Uh, we're asked to do things uh, a little bit um, at the last minute. Our schedules are hurried. We miss things. We're not involved in the project at the, at the right particular time. And uh, we make mistakes. We may, we may miss some things. That's one of the reasons why defects occur. Um, pressure's on time. Right now we live in an age where um, development is trying to do, we're, we're rushed to the finish line. And depending on your industry, this is a very important factor. Where well, you've got you've to gotta beat your competitors to the market. So we're trying to rush everything. So development doesn't have enough time. Testing doesn't have enough time. Everything is getting squeezed. So when everything is getting squeezed, oftentimes uh, you may miss uh, what's important. You may miss defects that get leaked to um, 
user acceptance tests uh, or production or, or to your clients. The complexity of code has, has increased in terms of all of the different platforms that we've got to support now. You know, when, uh, when I was coming along, and I might be aging myself, you know, the main languages were Fortran and, and COBOL. And uh, now a lot of those languages are obsolete. But you know what? A lot of our banking applications and things like that are still written in that code. So in many cases, uh, companies are, are rewriting those legacy systems. And, you know, the people that wrote that code may not even be around anymore. So there's some complexities with really translating a legacy code into, into more of the more more modern code, Java, C, C Sharp, uh, et cetera. So the, the complexities around uh, coding has gone up as well. Infrastructure, uh, now we've, we've got to test on so many different environments. It used to be, you know, just a desktop. Now there's a laptop, now there's a mobile phone, now there's uh, tablets. So our infrastructure complexity has skyrocketed as well, which has caused more testing. So more testing means that the high, there's a higher probability that we're going to miss something. You've got changing technologies that are happening right now, which are also uh, resulting in defects being missed. Uh, complex system interactions. Now we've got interact, the system is interacting with a lot of different types of systems. Uh, we've got cloud-based systems now, so our interactions are becoming more complex. Um, inconsistent usage or lack of tools. Um, as we have gone to some of the more development processes around Agile and things like that, there's a lot of inconsist inconsistency with how we're using our requirements management tools, our test management tools, or lack of tools. Uh, all together. And then lastly, we've got our development processes where um, everything used to be waterfall, but now, whether you like it or not, uh, many companies are being forced to, to, uh, to adopt more agile processes. But the problem here is if your organization isn't, ha doesn't have some level of maturity, uh, that just uh, amplifies the problem. Uh, as we look at waterfall versus agile, I'm sure that there's, there's more causes for, for, for defects, but those are just some of the most common. Uh, as we look at our waterfall methodology, very straightforward. This is what most of us learn to uh, learn to, to become a part of as a developer or as a tester. Whereas well, you've got your, your typical waterfall mo model of analyze or discovery, uh, design, developing code, and then test. And then as you go into your more agile methods, methods it's much more iterative. Well, uh, the iterations, if you don't have good processes, you don't have your organization set up properly, can, as I mentioned, amplify the problem. And it still doesn't stop defects from happening. Uh, the one advantage of, of going to a more agile method is you're able to, to find some defects earlier rather than backloading all of your testing until the end. So that's, that's a benefit of agile, but there's still issues with the overall agile process in terms of preventing defects in the first place. Um, as we look at um, typical uh, requirement challenges. You can see that, and, you know, at the top, this is what often happens from a waterfall perspective. Uh, you've got the swing at the top, and then what you deliver is really the, the swing inside of the tree, and that's 100% and that's due to how requirements uh, may change over time or uh, a lack of understanding of the initial requirements. And you can see from an agile perspective, you can see how um, the, the requirements have, have changed over time, but you're getting a little bit, you're getting a little bit better as you go from one agile iteration, iteration to the next. A little bit better than waterfall, but still not 
perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so let's look at the overall defect prevention uh, life cycle for a second. So you can see uh, when you think about defect prevention, it's, you really have to look at uh, understanding the process. So there's a process breakdown when it comes to identifying defects, having the right uh, checkpoints in place, and then doing something about it. So this is a good graphical representation of of there's some defect prevention learning or mindset that your organization has to adopt because this just this isn't just the job of the QA or testing folks. Uh, everyone that's a part of your project must have uh, a mindset shift around why this is important. So there's some defect prevention training or learning that has to take place at the organizational level. Uh, in terms of understanding how defects are getting introduced into your overall into your overall uh, application. So there's some short-term things or some quick fixes and then as you go through your overall SDLC, understanding where those defects originated and then bringing them back and, and doing the root cause analysis, which is going to be very, very important. We'll get into that when we get into our metrics discussion. But feeding this input back into your overall software production. Um, in terms of defect prevention, there are uh, really four basic defect prevention techniques that uh, are part of uh, really ways in which a tester can inject himself early in the process to help identify and remove defects. Risk-based testing, inspection, reviews, and walkthroughs. Uh, we'll talk about these, these briefly at a high level. Uh, Risk-based testing, the methodology that you would learn in this class is really, I, I want to call it risk-based testing on steroids. Uh, most of you probably have an idea of, of what risk-based testing is. And typically, most people would say, this is, this is where we want to test the most important things first. And that's a good definition of risk-based testing, but it, it really needs to go a lot, a lot deeper than that. You can see from this graphic here, uh, the methodology that I will be teaching talks about uh, doing a risk analysis, doing several phases during the SDLC, doing analyze, design, build, and even your testing phase. So, the reason that you would do this is because risk has a way of, of changing. It can, it can either minimize or it can go up over time. Uh, so risk really never stays the same. So it's important that you understand what your risks are at any given stage in the, in the overall SDLC. And when we talk about risk, this technique is really about evaluating and improving the quality of of requirements, which is really the, the first opportunity in which, as a tester, you really get to see what the product is going to be about, what it should do, what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to do it. So the, the most critical aspect of defect prevention from a testing perspective is a complete and thorough understanding of what the requirements are. Now that leads us to part of the problem is most companies don't write good requirements. Uh, so we would also spend, we, we need to understand what's a good requirement versus what's a bad requirement. But going through this process helps you really understand that. Another key to this process is most of the time as you review requirements, this is done in isolation. And the problem with isolate, with with doing a requirements review in isolation is uh, you are doing that review based on just your own understanding of the requirement, where this process um, enables or facilitates a group discussion around each requirement. So this includes your program manager, this includes your BA, this includes your developer, this also includes obviously 
uh, yourself as a representative of the testing team. All of these parties should be looking at the, at the exact same requirement at the exact same time, uh, but you're looking at them from a lot of different perspectives, and we're going to get to that shortly. But it's important that we not look at requirements in a vacuum or in isolation. They must be looked at in conjunction with uh, every with the rest of the team, so that you can gather different perspectives. Uh, this is a powerful exercise, and it, it evaluates and improves the quality of requirements. It improves the effectiveness of testing. It monitors how you're going to test that requirement. It identifies not only testing risk very early, but it also identifies development risk extremely early in the process. And you gain consensus on, on what is a high-risk requirement. Uh, another way of looking at this, so as I talked about, you would have a risk assessment at various checkpoints throughout your SDLC. As I mentioned, remember I said this is on steroids. So I would not recommend that you try to do all of these checkpoints, but if you were starting this out, I would definitely recommend a minimum of three checkpoints go before you go into your formal testing. Once it designed, I mean once it analyzed, once it designed, and once that and build. As you are completing this risk assessment, you are, as I mentioned, you're looking at each of these requirements, and they could be by application or portfolio. You're assessing, you are assessing the risk and determining what is the testing scope of that requirement. As you get into your um, uh, the rest of your, your risk assessment plan, you are identifying the methods in which you plan to test, when you plan to test, how you plan to test, and you're prioritizing those things based on your overall risk assessment. And as I mentioned, the key players that are involved here, you've got your test lead, release manager, you may have reporting team, application lead, architects means, your BA, design lead. Uh, so you want to have everyone that is knowledgeable about this requirement in the room at the same time. So what are you, uh, what's going to be your risk analysis or what's going to drive your risk rating? There's really four key aspects of this. Your first is Actually, your first two are going to be pretty common uh, for risk analysis. It's going to be the impact. So on a scale of one to five, we're going to use that as our scale. On a scale of one to five, what is, what's going to be the impact uh, of this requirement if it is not implemented properly? What's going to be the impact to the customer? Um, five is going to be critical impact. Now, you can your impact can be measured in several ways. Um, a five could be this requirement, if it's not implemented properly, might affect 100% of our customers, or it could be 80% of our customers, 70%. So you could use that as a measuring factor. Um, from your finance perspective, a five could be uh, if we don't implement this requirement or this particular feature, it's going to cause uh, $1 million or $250,000. That's what's going to be the impact. So from a business perspective, you can also give a rating of, of 5 to 1 based on financial impact, or it could be customer impact. But you want to have an idea of what is the, what's the impact from, from good to bad of not implementing this requirement the way it's intended to be implemented. Your second factor, and normally your, your developers as well as your BAs, um, someone from the business would be able to quantify this. Probability. So <clears throat> this is an assessment of your probability of being able to implement this particular uh, this particular requirement or, or feature set, or the probability that if it's not done, it's going to cause problems. So again, you want to give that a scale of, of five to one, very likely versus unlikely. This puts your, if you were thinking about a defect, this would align to your severity and probability. That's how you would look at impact and probability here.
again, your development team, as well as from a testing perspective, definitely representatives from your business would be able to quantify the probability of uh, or, or usage of, of your customer using this particular requirement or feature. Let's come down to level of control. Now it gets a little bit interesting. So your level of control is the level of control that your development team really has over this requirement. So from an implementation perspective, a five would be uh, we have total control over how this, this feature or this requirement is going to be implemented. It's a minimal piece of code. It, it only impacts, let's say, one module. Um, no control would mean that perhaps we're getting some software from a, a third party. We have very little control in terms of how it was developed. Possibly this piece of code is distributed across 10 or more modules. There's a host of, of different developers that are responsible for, for this particular requirement. So you can see we want to quantify the, the level of development control that we have over implementing that particular requirement or, or feature. Very important to understanding risk. All of these are important to quantifying risk. The last lever is going to be around a level of confidence. So this is where the testing team comes in really heavily. So what's our level of confidence that we can test this requirement? Based on your understanding, do you have everything that you need from an environment perspective, from a data perspective, from an understanding of how the customer is going to use this, this feature or this requirement? Can we adequately test this requirement based on the information that we have today. Again, we're going to give that um, a, a scale of, of, of five to one based on risk. Now, uh, I've skipped a few slides, but basically you would, you would quantify these four items would give you a risk rating. And you are calculating that risk uh, doing several, as we talked about, doing analyze, doing design, and doing build. These are just various checkpoints. And you can see how this particular requirement has either gone down in risk or gone up in risk based on the information that you have. Now, one of the ways in which you could go down in risk is, uh, which is quite common, you see a requirement during, let's say, during analyze. You have very little understanding of that requirement, so the risk rating for that, that particular requirement is pretty high. But then you do another checkpoint with the same requirement during design. By that time, we found out a little bit more information. Uh, may, maybe perhaps we've done some initial testing, so the level of risk around control has gone down. Maybe now that they've added additional information to the requirement, we can test it better. So now our overall risk of this requirement has, has gone down to a, a low during this checkpoint. And then perhaps something changed between the build and coding, and coding phase uh, for that particular requirement. But this allows you to see where each requirement is, and you can do this at the requirement level or at the application level. And this drives your testing priorities in terms of what you're going to test, how you're going to test. I know it might be a little difficult for you to see this right now because we tried to shorten things up for, for the webinar, but during the one-day training, we'll, we'll walk through how these requirements can change uh, based on one checkpoint to the next and how you need to adjust your testing, um, your testing strategy in order to accommodate the risk. Um, we'll talk about risk, so we'll understand product risk versus project risk. At a high level, your product risks are going to be, these are the things that we need to test. Whether at the requirements level, you might have environment variables, you might have uh, technology issues, you might have data issues. Um, and then at the project level, so this might be, we might might be expecting automation or we might be expecting a third-party application. 
And here we're going to have to adjust our testing strategy in order to mitigate those things. So we'll, we'll walk through at a high level what some of those product risks uh, or versus our, our project risk and how we can relate that. A very simplistic risk model, most of us are used to this, is going back to the earlier model, likelihood versus impact, scale of one to three, where we would look at at a, at a feature level, what's the likelihood of a client using uh, client update uh, versus uh, other features, and we could do that by likelihood and impact. And based on our, our quotient, we would times the likelihood by impact, and this would also give us a priority. So we'll walk through a very simplistic uh, risk analysis as well using that. I know that the risk-based testing technique that I went through a couple of slides ago was probably very complex, but at a minimum, you should be able to use this. And this technique allows you, again, to be able to prioritize, really, uh, what you test and also be able to understand what you can what you can and eliminate uh, if you have to reduce your testing cycle so at least you can make sure that your most important features are being tested at the appropriate time uh, walkthroughs reviews and inspections I won't spend a lot of time with this but it's going to be very important that you understand really uh, what your role is as a tester so uh, from a static testing perspective, we'll talk about manual versus static. So these are the things that you do before formal testing or an application is actually written. So that comes in, in the form of reviews. Uh, the RBT is a formal review, and these can be formal or informal. And then you've got some automated static techniques used with the, the use of a static testing tool. Uh, the typical review process is uh, there's a planning phase, um, there's a kickoff phase where the artifact is being distributed, the artifacts are being reviewed. Again, this is usually done in isolation, and then your reviewers come together and you talk about what issues were found with that particular artifact. Now, your artifact could be requirements, it could be design doc, it could be code, it could be test plan, it could be strategy, but this is your typical review process. So you would follow this iterative process and give the feedback back to the author while they uh, made, those, uh, made those adjustments. Uh, inspections, um, so we talk about inspections for a little bit. Inspections is your most formal type of process, type of review process. And normally, companies can get some training on how to conduct inspections. You would have a moderator who is trained in terms of that, it can walk you through how, a, how an inspection is supposed to go. It looks almost the same as a regular review, but there are templates that you use. There are, uh, you're tracking and you're absolutely uh, capturing metrics and you're identifying the cost of those metrics found versus found in later phases. Uh, as we talk about static analysis tools, this is an extremely important tool that you can implement if you're a developer uh, or you should be advising your developers. So this is basically uh, after the code has been written, this is a tool that developers can run that can identify uh, issues within their code. This one tool can eliminate lots of issues that, that developers often overlook. This is not a compiler. The application is not running. This is almost like doing an MRI. Uh, on your body or doing an MRI on a particular segment of code. What this does, it identifies areas of complexity, consistency, inconsistency, security risk, conformance at the code level for developers. And the reason why this is so important is the more complex a module is, the more difficult it's going to be to test. Uh, the more difficult it's going to be to, deb to debug and fix if there's issues. So developers may have a complexity measure that they want to make sure that their modules or aspects of their code don't exceed. So this is very important, not just from a development perspective, but it also identifies areas of code that are pretty complex from a testing perspective. Obviously, we want to test those areas a little bit more 
more thoroughly. This also lends itself to co-coverage tools. Co-coverage tools we talk about will tell you the quality of the test cases that you run. It's not a static analysis tool. This is a tool that gets implemented uh, right before you're, you're about to execute all of your test cases. So you would execute your test suite, and it's going to tell you the lines and paths uh, of code statements that your tests have executed. It's an extremely powerful tool that allows you to see really the quality of your testing and most importantly the areas where you've tested versus the areas uh, that you have not tested. Um, as we segue into um, defect detection, which are going to be your more traditional types of testing types, we'll talk about functional testing types or versus structural testing types. We'll talk about um, leveraging the B model, verification versus validation. On the left side, this gets into more of your static testing, your reviews, walkthroughs, and inspections versus on the right-hand side of this being more of your, your validation type of testing uh, via uh, unit testing, integration, system or product tests, and then acceptance tests. Um, several types of structural test techniques. We have stress testing, uh, recovery, compliance, security, um, several functional testing techniques. You've got regression, error handling, inner system, inner compatibility, parallel testing. Uh, as we move into process improvement, um, process improvement is a very important aspect that every QA person should have a a hat that he wears because our job is really not just to not just to test the application that we're working on. Our job is really to identify issues in the process, whether it's part of the development process or part of the testing process that can be improved. This is how organizations mature, whether it's how we handle requirements, how we do design reviews, coding reviews, how we even test our own applications. Uh, so it's very important that we have a, a mind for understanding test process improvement. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, as we move into metrics, um, this is really where a lot of what you're doing today can identify areas for process improvement. There are a lot of different metrics that we should be collecting as a part of our test process. For the purpose of this uh, class or course, we're going to focus on what are the metrics um, that drive process improvement, uh, some of which we've already talked about. One is your defect discovery phase. This is where you found the defect, when you found the defect. Um, defect discovery method. So this is the testing method that you use to identify uh, how you found that defect. It's very important that we understand what methods are effective versus what methods are not effective from a testing perspective. Your defect origination phase, so we remember that from our first couple of slides. So this was, this is the phase in which the, your defect first got injected or got originated into the application on the product. Root cause, root cause, this is understanding the fundamental primary reason why this defect happened. What caused this defect? Uh, secondly, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth metric, what uh, your defect resolution type. So how did you resolve this defect? And then lastly, your defect leakage, re leakage reason. Why did we not find this defect in an earlier test phase, whether it be in, in coding or, or unit test or in our formal testing phase? Uh, why did this defect leak to uh, whether it be UAT or to production. It's very important to understand what that leakage reason is because that's an area for process improvement. As we go through some of these, and I just outlined a few, we want to look at what are some of your typical root cause examples. Now this is around your or origination phase. 
um, concept, analyze, design, build, testing. Your root cause at this level, uh, primarily when you're thinking about analyze, these are around requirements. So it could have been a missing requirement, ambiguous requirement, <coughs> a wrong requirement, change requirement, etc. Design perspective, you could have had missing uh, logic or long, wrong logic or the logic was changed or inconsistently used uh, during the bill cycle. So this is where your, your unit testing uh, is occurring. So this could have been a coding error, syntax, bad data, initialization, logic error, uh, memory usage, etc. And then testing. So yes, testing can cause a defect. If you're using bad test data, if you're if there are issues with your test environment, uh, if you've got a plain old tester error, uh, the test script was wrong, you may have had a configuration management issue. These are all root causes for how testing can actually inject a defect. Let's jump into some of the metrics as we wrap up the last few minutes of this. Um, the purpose of this metric is really to look at your defects by discovery phase. So you can see, and we're using a tool, so part of this is making sure you've got consistent usage of your tools as well. Now we'll look at this metric, as I mentioned, this is, you're looking at defects by discovery phase. So this is where you found the defect. In this particular graph, we can see that, or we can look at the histogram, that for this particular project, we found 82% of the defects in the formal testing phase. Uh, we found 5% 5 leak to production, which is that number there. Um, we've got 4% uh, that uh, was discovered in design. We've got 1% in analyze. We've got 8% in your bill phase. This is going back to uh, one of our first couple of slides, this is indicative of how most testing phases are done, where the lion's share, uh, more than 80% of the defects are not found until the testing team gets involved. This is not good stage containment. This is way too late. Uh, the companies that are really serious about this, this is completely unacceptable. We will, the goal for defect prevention is really to push a lot of these numbers earlier in the SDLC. So we should be seeing numbers in analyze, design, and build. And as you can see, very few defects were even found during those phases. So but this tells you exactly the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of a lot of your defect testing. So this is an important metric for you to look at as we look at the next phase. So this is defects by testing phase. If you remember, I'm going to go back. So we're looking at the same data here. You saw that 82% were found during your testing phase. Now what we've done is we've broken down what that testing phase consisted of. So your testing phase consisted of component testing, integration testing, system or in the end testing, and also user acceptance testing. So let's look at some of these metrics we can see that we found 50% during integration testing, we found 25% during system or end-to-end -end testing, we found 10% uh, during UAT or 200 defect, that's what these numbers represent. We found 15% during, um, <clears throat> during our component or unit test. So this breaks down the 80% that we talked about on the previous slide. So, you know, this actually is not too bad. We would want to see more defects found during component or unit testing, but a lot of defects were found during integration, and then uh, moderate defects were found in testing. So in terms of who's doing what, typically your, your, development, your developers will be doing your component and integration testing. So for this particular application, they did a decent job there. But what's troubling me uh, from a testing perspective are uh, this 5% or this 10% that has escaped or linked into UAT. 
So this is about 200 defects that leaked beyond our component integration system testing. So as a test manager, I've, <coughs> excuse me, I've got to understand what this is. What are these 200 defects that escaped my formal testing phases? Now, if these, uh, in my perspective, the only reason a defect should leak to UAT would be maybe they're using a different environment or different test data. But if they're using the same environment that we conducted really our end-to-end -end testing in, and the test data is the same, then I've got a problem with them finding, I don't say I have a problem, I have a problem with how this many defects leak from my testing phase. So I've got to understand what makes up this 200 defects. If they're uh, medium and low defects, that might be okay, but if the majority of this these defects are, are high and critical defects, then there's something in my testing process that, that is broken. And we've got to figure out uh, why that occurred in the first place. As we move on, we're trying to rush a little bit. Now we're looking at our defects by discovery method. You can see for this particular application, we found roughly 50% of our defects were found via uh, traditional or manual testing. We saw that 11% were via automation, 4% uh, we were doing some unit testing, 21% <coughs> were found during, uh, so this is where our developer was testing after, after uh, code complete. So we've, he's given the code to us, so we're testing, and now the developer is still doing a little bit of his own testing. So he found 200 defects, so 21% of the defects were there. And then this last bucket is around 15%. Uh, we don't know what the method was. So I'll start there. So this gets back to our usage of our testing tool. So for this particular application, this was not a required field. So if it wasn't a required field, the tester didn't put any method that was used. So this is one thing from a process perspective we've got to fix. We need to understand how you found the defect. So this field, from a testing perspective, must be required because if I don't know what, what technique I used, I can't measure in terms of its effectiveness. Let's look at some of these other metrics. I'll jump down to automation. <clears throat> So 11% were found via automation tools. So that's interesting, but it depends on what I'm using my automation for. If I've got a progressive automation team and I'm spending, and I'm spending, and I'm just using an example, two million dollars a year for automation, I've got to, I've got to judge whether 11% across my projects is a good return on investment for my automation. If this is just regression, then that might be okay. But at least I know what my automated test suite is finding. Uh, the part that would also concern me is going to be, so these are my developers that are now testing after code complete. So my question back to my developers would be, okay, why didn't you find these doing your, your unit testing or, or component testing? You know, I'm glad you took the time to do some testing here, but I would have much better preferred you find these 200 defects doing your own unit testing. <clears throat> so that's a good metric as well in terms of uh, making process improvement changes to your, your development process. Each of these uh, has distinct metrics and things that can infer, that can tell us things that we're doing in our organization. Defects by origination phase. So now, so this is where the defect was in injected or, or, or where the defect was first originated or introduced into the application. You can see from this perspective, I'll go to the histogram. During Analyze, going back to our first graphic, we said that what 40 to 60 percent of defects were <clears throat> injected or introduced during Analyze. So here we got 9 percent. So I would question that a little bit. I would, I would see, do you guys really understand what this field means? which can be highly probable because if you're not if you're not making sure that the data in your metrics is good you can get some garbage data 
So that's from a testing perspective. Your job is to make sure that the data that <clears throat> is being put in your defect management tool is going to be accurate. You can see that 7% were injected during your design phase. So I would, you know, I would think that there should be a higher percentage of defects that originated in these phases. So that would be a red flag for me. You can see that from a bill perspective, 42% <clears throat> of defects were injected in build. That's pretty high. So if I'm a development manager, I would say, you know what, are your guys following standardized uh, coding, coding guidelines? Are you guys doing peer review? Because this is pretty high. Again, I would question that number because that, that, that's unusually high. From a testing perspective, now this is free for us. I got about 20% of defects that were injected or originated in my testing phase. If you remember, if I went back to the root cause slide, um, the ways in which a defect can originate here is going to be test data, test environment, the tester made an error, uh, the tester uh, maybe recorded wrong results, there may be a configuration management issue there. So I want to make sure that this is accurate. And if the majority of these are my testers making errors, then maybe I've got some education to do there. And then we've got 3% that originated in production. 3% uh, may not be too bad, but if the 3% are all severity ones and twos, then you've got a problem there. Uh, one of the biggest problems on this slide goes back to tool usage, where for this particular tool, this was not a required field. And so if it wasn't a required field, then the developer or the tester did not put the origination phase in the defect, which is a problem. As I move to, and I'm rushing here, we just got a couple of minutes. Um, I didn't see any questions that came through. Um, I will leave up my email address if you've got any follow-up questions here. But this is how the defect was, this is how the defect was resolved. Um, here, the change was implemented, meaning it was a defect. Here, as designed, so this was a, this is a illegitimate or inadequate defect that was returned by the development team. So I need to understand why my tester thought it was a defect in the first place. I had eight percent duplicates, so my testers not talking to each other. Uh, Non-reproducible, I got 7% here, so why can't I reproduce it in my test environment, but the developers can, reduce, can re, uh, reproduce it in theirs? Uh, let's see, that's all I want to talk about. I could talk about more on this slide, but I'm trying to get through. Uh, cost of poor quality, so this is the overall cost of, of, of defects. We want to understand what it costs in order to fix defects by severity. So there's some metrics that we can look at there. Um, actually, I'll go ahead and in in the webinar there. As you can see, there's a there's a ton of information that we can do from a defect pre, uh, prevention perspective. Uh, again, uh, we are offering a one day course so that we can thoroughly talk about all of these topics and sections. And if you have any questions around any of the content that we covered today, my email address is mike.ennis1911 at gmail.com. We'd love to get your feedback. Um, I know that I sort of gave you the fire hose today, but I appreciate your time and your attentiveness over this past hour. Uh, I'll turn it back over to, to Eric. Thank you, Mike, for your time today, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's free webinar sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. For more information on how IIST can help you or your organization, please visit testinginstitute.com. As Mike uh, mentioned, there was a lot of content that was given today in this webinar. Unfortunately, uh, due to the one-hour time limit, we weren't able to go on even more. So there is a full-day live online interactive course uh, April 19th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. To learn more about this and to register, go to testinginstitute.com slash online slash liveinteractive.php. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more information about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you all again for joining us today, and have a great day. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, folks.